All right, now, um, my sermon this morning, I'll be preaching on the important job of being a mother. Of course, today's Mother's Day, and we're honoring and giving respect uh, to mothers for their, for their great work and the, and the hard job that they do. And, um, you know, people might say, oh, it's Mother's Day. Why, why are you bringing up Mother's Day? That's not in the Bible. But no, it is. I mean, the Bible says to honor your father and your mother. There's absolutely nothing wrong with taking a day out of the year and saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to give honor and we're going to respect and we're going to appreciate and show our appreciation towards our mothers that have done all this, you know, all this hard work for us. And that's, you know, and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with celebrating a day like today. And that's why we're doing this. And I'd like to, to hopefully be able to shed some more light on, on what the Bible talks about, about the job of a mother and, um, and how really, ultimately how important that job is. Because there is, I mean, this is one of the absolute most important jobs in the entire world is the job of being a mother. And a lot of people don't realize that, and a lot of people, a lot of mothers today don't even understand that. And unfortunately, they're not doing a very good job because they don't really appreciate and, and give um, respect to the, to the actual job that they had before them. Now, keep your finger there in 1 Timothy 5. We're going to be coming back to that, but turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter number 3. We're going to go back to the, the first mother created on this earth. We're going to see in Genesis chapter 3. But you see, and I'm going to be starting off with this because there's a, there's a lot of importance and meaning given to people's names in the Bible. When you look at people's names, you'll often see the reason why they're called something is because of something else. So like, people will receive different names. You remember Abram, God changed his name to Abraham. Sarai, God changed her name to Sarah. And you know, in Abraham's instance, it was because God had made him a, a, a father of many nations. So that's like the reasoning behind his name. His name actually got a new meaning when God gave him a new name. And you see oftentimes, you know, the apostle Paul was used to be named Saul. You know, um, Peter, had his name was changed from Simon to Peter or Cephas, right, which means a stone. And um, there's always meaning behind people's names and places' names as well. When the Bible gives a name, it's always saying, this is, you know, this is the reason why. And we're going to see that here with Eve. Look down at verse number 20, 20 of Genesis chapter 3. The Bible says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So the reason behind Eve's name, the reason why Adam gave her that name is because she was the mother of all living. And that's what that name means. Essentially, Eve means, you know, she's the mother. She's the mother of all living. And um, what's important, what, the reason why I'm even bringing this up is because a person's name is like, it's a part of their identity. Now, the identity of Eve was, was wrapped up in the fact that she was a mother. That she was the mother of all living. That was a very important thing. That's a monumental event for her life. And that's something that kind of identified what her life was all about. She was a mother. And she was going to be the mother of all living. And it's an extremely important job. And it's, and it's, so, you know, it's such a big deal that that's what her name represents. Now, of course, like I just mentioned, today's a day where we're honoring mothers. And we're also recognizing that difficulty and importance that their, that their job has. And first of all, it's, you know, I shouldn't even have to point this out today, but it's obvious you know, God has equipped us as men and as women to perform different roles, to perform different functions. You know, that's why we're completely different. God has designed women to be mothers, right? Like a man can't be a mother. It's just not going to work. It's impossible. The, the, there's no way they can do that. And, just, and likewise, you know, a woman can't be a father. You need to have both. And when God ordained the family, he ordained a, a man and a woman, and they come together in marriage, and they start that family, and they have children, but they each have separate roles, and it doesn't make one role better than another. They're, they're, they're equal in value. You know, the, the husband, the wife, they're both, they're both children of God, hopefully, in God's eyes. You know, they, God values them both immensely and loves them both equally, but... It doesn't mean that their jobs are the same. God has equipped women to nurture, and, and I mean, even the, the spirit that women have and the, and the emotions that they have is different than men. And they're, and they're designed, God has designed us specifically, and specifically women is designed to bring up and nurture and love the children and look out for them. And I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why so many women are good at multitasking. I know my wife's able to, to do 10 things at one time and also keep her eye on the kids. There's no way I would be able to do that ever. <laughs> and it's just part of my programming as a man. It's, it's easier for me to focus on one task. And I think in general, women were designed different. They're designed to be able to, to handle these tasks and to, and to do these type of jobs. 
Whereas men are physically stronger, men are designed to go out and work and, and, to, and to support the family. This is what God has ordained for, for men and women in general, for, for husbands and wives and for fathers and mothers. We have different jobs, but it doesn't make one job better than another. And what we're going to see today, we're going to kind of dig into a mother's job of how extremely important that is. Now, the father's job is important also, but we're not going to get into that today. It's not Father's Day, it's Mother's Day. So um, flip back, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter number 5, because we're going to see here just a little bit about that role that God has ordained for women in 1 Timothy 5, verse number 14. And you know what? In 2014, this verse isn't very popular. This verse is not something that... This, this will make people bristle. But, I mean, we have to understand, first of all, look, I didn't write this book. God wrote it. This is God's the author of the Bible. And we need to come... And, and to an understanding of saying, well, look, this is what his word says. You could either accept or reject it. But look at verse, 1 Timothy 5.14. It says, I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. That's, that's what, what um, Paul's saying here to Timothy. He's saying, I will. That's, that's what he wants. Therefore, that the younger women, he said, they should marry. They should have children, bear children, and guide the house. Those are the primary functions that are, that are given there. That's the primary role that, that he's given here for the, for the younger women to do. And that that's what they ought to do. And that's what they're designed to do. That's what God has intended for them to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. See, we live in a world today where, where people want to make women more like men. People are, there's this gender-bending attitude of like, well, in order for you to be successful as a woman, you need to be more like a man. You need to go out in the workforce. You need to go and become an executive. You need to go and do all this other stuff and pay for someone else to raise your children. And they call that success. But that's not what God has designed for us. That's not what God has designed for women specifically. He said, look, the man's supposed to go out and work. The man is supposed to provide for his household. The man is supposed to go to work and, and work hard and love his wife and do all these things so that she can stay home. Look, God has given you the children that he's given you because you are the one that are responsible for them and he thinks that you're the one that is most um, capable of bringing them up, right? If he wanted someone else to raise your children, then he would have given your children unto them at birth. God has given us the responsibilities. God has given mothers and fathers the responsibility of raising their children, but specifically the mothers. It's, a mother's job is important and their, their job, it says here, is to bear children, guide the house, make sure everything's running right within the house, you know, being a homemaker, there's nothing wrong with being a homemaker. Guiding the house, it's very biblical. Again, people today will scoff at that, but this is what the Bible teaches. Now, um, obviously, too, you know, not all women are mothers, but um, there is, I believe, a special honor that belongs unto mothers that is, that is um, above just being a woman in general. And... Um, it's important to note here, too, that having children is a blessing from God. It absolutely is. And we're going to see a lot of scripture that, that deals with this. But, we see, we live in a, fa in a society today where people have come to despise large families and people who have a lot of children. And it's kind of looked down upon and people will mock that and, and, and just say, oh, what are, you, you know, what are you thinking? What are you doing? And a lot of the reason for this is because people have become so selfish and self-centered and focused on money and saying, oh, well, how are you going to afford those kids? As if money is the thing that really matters. Look, God's going to provide. God has promised to provide our needs. He's promised to give us food. He's promised to give us um, clothing. And he says, you know, to be content with such things as we have. And we're going to see here that, you know, having children is definitely going to require some faith. But... We shouldn't be taking those matters in our own hands. See, even Christians today, they're out using birth control. They're having abortions. There's such an ignorance in our country of what God's Word actually says about this. But we're going to look into it and just see what the Bible has to say. So turn, if you would, to Psalm 127. But first, we're going to see what the Bible says about having children in general. Psalm 127. And I'll read this for you while you turn to Psalm 27. Genesis 24, verse 60 says, And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her. This is when Rebekah was, was leaving her family and going to be Isaac's husband. Right? This is the blessing that Rebekah was given by her own family. It says, 
Thou art our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions. And let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. Now, people today would be like, whoa, what are you talking about? Thousands of millions. Now, of course, I mean, that's a huge number, but it's a great blessing. And that's actually, I believe that's the biggest number that's, that's actually given in the Bible. Thousands of millions. Or um, billions. Right? That's, that's a huge number. And they're saying that's their blessing for Rebecca. Hey, we wish that you would be the, the mother of thousands of millions, that you would just have such a great multitude of children. Now, obviously, this isn't just referring to her personally either. Right? It's talking about her descendants and everything else, that, that she would just be so blessed that they would be fruitful and they would multiply and they would have all these children. That was a blessing that's given to her. But today, and it seems like today's society, is that people say, oh, well, you should just only have like two kids and then stop at that. Look at Psalm 127. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. So the Bible saying, here, look, children are a reward. Children are the heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the, of the womb is God's reward unto you. Fruit, obviously, the fruit of your womb is having a baby, is having a child. And that's what he says, as arrows are. So in the hand of a mighty man, a warrior, you know, they have a quiver full of arrows. They have all kinds of arrows. So if you're going to war, you're going to need to have a lot more than just one or two arrows. You're going to be shooting at the enemy. You're going to, you're going to want a whole quiver full of arrows. And that's what he's comparing that analogy of a mighty man having a whole quiver full of arrows to, to, to attack the enemy is saying, so are children of the youth. And again, I mean, we could go on and on on just all the truth found in, this ver in these verses. You know, people there are again saying, well, you need to wait to have children. You need to wait till you get older. Wait till you're 30. Wait till, you know, wait till you get a job. Wait till you get to college. Wait till you get established. Do all these different things. The Bible says, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. The Bible says you're going to be happy if, you're, if your quiver is full of children, if you have lots of children. It says, they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Look, this is what the Bible says, and there is not one scripture in the entire Bible that ever tells you to limit the number of children that you have. It's not found. It's not there. All we ever find is God saying, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, go out and be fruitful. He's saying, you know, children are a heritage of the Lord. It's a blessing. You're happy if you have your quiver full of them. You know, the blessings are, hey, be a mother of thousands of millions. That's what the Bible teaches, and that's what the Bible says without fail. And I would challenge you to show me something different from the Bible. And actually, the Bible says that God is the one that opens and closes the womb. It's not our responsibility. God has taken that responsibility on himself. Every woman the Bible ever talks about being barren, being barren meaning not able to have children, every single one ends up having children. But today we have people that want to take matters into their own hands. But see, we got to do it God's way. God wants us to pray to him. God wants us to rely on him. God wants us to entreat him and go to him when we have need. Just like Isaac did, he prayed for 20 years to have a child. And that answer, that, that prayer was finally answered. Now it took a long time. It took 20 years. But he left that in God's hand. He didn't try to take matters into his own hand and play God, so to speak, with with their reproductive systems and, and try to make things work. If God's not opening up the womb, then God's not opening up the womb. And I'll give you, I'm going to run through, you don't have to turn to these if you don't want to, but Genesis 28, I'm going to run through these because there's, there's so many verses that talk about God opening and closing the womb. Genesis 20:18 says, For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Genesis 29, 31 says, And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. Genesis 32. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in God's stead who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? So, you know, Jacob's even saying, Hey, look, am I God that I'm withholding you having a child? God's the one that opens and closes the womb. Genesis 30, 22 says, And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her. He listened to her prayer and opened her womb. He allowed her to have children. 1 Samuel 1, 5 says, 1, 5 through 6 says, But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. 
And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. So we see here, again, in one more verse, Isaiah 44, 24 says, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. God is the only one capable of creating life. God is the one that opens up the womb. God is the one that closes the womb. God is the one that says, you know, this, this is going to happen, this is not. God's the one that gives you the right amount of children that's right for you to have. Now, we see in the Bible, just because you have a normal relationship, if you don't use birth control, it doesn't mean you're just going to automatically have 20 children. If God's the one in charge of opening the womb and closing the womb, then God's the one that will decide, hey, you might only have one son. You might only have one daughter. You might only have two. You might have three. Whatever it may be, we don't know. But let's leave that in God's hands. Let's leave that up to God to decide how many children that we have and let him open and close the womb as the Bible so clearly says that he, that he does. And um, let's understand that children are a blessing. But now let's um, get past the, just, just understanding having a children. See, it's important for young women to understand this too, that, that they don't get brainwashed with the, with the world's philosophies. That we understand what the Bible talks about having children, what the Bible talks about being blessed. I, there is no, I love the fact that we have three little girls. They are such a tremendous blessing to us, to me and my wife, our family. They make us happy every single day of our life. There's a certain joy that we receive from our children that we would never get any other by any other means. It's a different joy. It's a different blessing. That you can't get with money, you can't get with finances, you can't get with a nice house or with a nice car or with any of these other things that you might want to work for and, and say, well, I don't want children. Children truly are a blessing. And it doesn't matter how much money you have in this life. See, we got to get past this thing and, oh, well, I have to have all this money, I have to send them through college, I have to do all this stuff. No. You have to raise them right. You have to get, just teach them. Because look, God can control how much money you have too. He can control whether you're blessed with a lot of finances or not. No matter how hard of a work you are, if God does not want you to have a lot of money, God can make sure that doesn't happen. So if you spend your time just going after and chasing after money and chasing after money and chasing after money because you want to be able to have all this wealth amassed to yourself before you have children, well, God might make sure you never have that wealth. It's possible. Now look, I'm not saying that's always going to happen by any means, but, but that very well might be the case. If you want to focus, look, focus on the things that matter. Focus on the things that are important. And look, your children are important. And what's way more important than having money for them is raising them right. Now, we're going to get into the importance of the mother's role, of how extremely important this is. Now, you often find in the book of Kings, especially in 2 Kings, you remember in the book of Kings, it says, you know, um, that this king lived this long, and then he died at this long, and then so-and-so became king after him. Well, in some of those verses, not all of them, and in some of those verses, it'll mention the names of the mothers the mother of the kings. And there's a few different reasons for that, I believe, but one reason I think is to give the mother credit for raising her, child, her son right. Because the mother's job is so vital. And especially you think about a king, right? A king has a lot of influence. A king has a lot of power. The king is in a position there. And I think more often than not, when you see the mother's name mentioned, you'll see that king that did right in the eyes of God. And it's kind of interesting to see that because... I think God's kind of giving credit and saying, okay, yeah, this is his mother's name. Because his mother was the one that brought him up from a young child. And when he grows up and does that which is right in the sight of God, hey, that is a tremendous blessing. That is a great honor bestowed upon that mother that the work that she did, that everything that she did raised that child as a young, as a young boy, or as a young man growing up, that when they grow old, they're going to serve God and they're going to do that which is right in the eyes of God. I don't care, I mean, and, and I bet, you can ask any mother today, and anyone that's got their head on straight, if you ask, would you rather your son be rich and successful and have a mansion, have all this money, and not be right with God, or would you rather just have your son do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord? And if your heart's in the right place, you're going to say, you know what, I don't care, I'm not going to judge the, a person's success on how much wealth that they have. I'm going to judge their success based on how well they live, based on their integrity, based on their truthfulness to God's word. That is what really matters, and that is what is so important about being a mother. 
That is why it's so much more important for the mother to be spending time with their children and raising them and teaching them right according to God's word than it is for them to go out and get a job. The teaching that children receive as young children is so, is so crucial for them in how they're going to grow up and how they're going to live the rest of their life. <clears throat> Proverbs 31. Turn there if you would, please. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 is a, is a chapter that's known um, for, the, for the virtuous woman. It's a great chapter of the Bible talking about these great attributes that women can have, can strive for to, to, to be a righteous woman. Proverbs 31. But we see right off the bat, as I was kind of mentioning earlier with the kings, and, and the credit being given to the mothers who raised their children right, and they ended up doing right in the eyes of the Lord. Verse number 1 of chapter 31 in Proverbs says, Now these are the words of King Lemuel. This is a king. This proverb, you know, not all the Proverbs were, were written down by Solomon. This was King Lemuel, the last proverb in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 31. The words of King Lemuel, but look at what it is, the prophecy that his mother taught him. This is wisdom. This is God's word that Lemuel received from his mother. His mother taught him the Bible. His mother taught him this prophecy. Now, he's the one that's writing that, you know, that God's using to, to pen down these words, but they're actually his mother's words. And, and um, we see here, verse 2, it says, What my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law, and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So we see here, um, she's teaching her son, Right off the bat, these great truths. And he said, look, it's not for kings to go drink alcohol. He's teaching them, look, don't be a drunk. Don't go out and drink alcohol. Don't mess around with it. It's going to pervert your judgment. Look, hey, it's not for kings to do that. And look, you might not. Say, you might say, oh, well, well, I'm not in a kingly line. You know, my, my, my child's not going to grow up to be king. Hey, but is that how you view them? You ought to view your children with that much importance. Maybe they won't grow up to be the, you know, the king of America like Obama is today or something. Or like he thinks he is. <laughs> yeah, I know we're not under a kingdom, but it's, it seems that way more and more as the, as the day goes on. But, um, you know, all joking aside, view your children as extremely important. Whether or not they are going to ascend up into some throne. Your children are important. They ought to be important to you. And you ought to view them and have a vision for them that says, hey... My son, my daughter, they're going to be important people. And I'm going to tell them, hey, look, let these other people just, just go and, and drink their, their sorrows away and just be in the gutter. But that's not for you. You're better than that. We've got a plan for you. You know, God has a plan for you, and we want you to walk in that plan. Look, don't, don't get messed up and stuff. And, and this is a prophecy that she's teaching us. And it's interesting, too. I've mentioned this before. You know, it says the prophecy that his mother taught him. Prophecy is not always talking about future events. None of these things are talking about things that are going to happen at the end times or way in the future. Prophecy is a preaching or a teaching. This is a teaching that she taught him, and very, very important teaching. This is coming from his mother. But let's continue on here because she's going to go on. You know, like verse 7 says, let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. So yeah, let, let those people do that, but that's not for you. The mother needs to teach her children this stuff and... It says, open thy mouth for the dumb, and the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. In verse 8, verse 9, open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. These are core, essential values, godly values, godly attributes that this mother is teaching her son and saying, look, this is so important, you need to know this. You need to open up your mouth for the dumb, those that can't speak for themselves, those that aren't able to, 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 to help themselves. You need to stand up, you need to speak for them. You need to judge righteously, plead the cause of the poor and the needy. The poor and the needy don't have means to, to always you know, take care of themselves. They, you need to be able to stand up and judge that righteous judgment for them and, and be able to help others out that are in need of help. And these are just, just key values that this mother is teaching her child. And this is what you know, all mothers should be teaching their children. This is God's word, and this, and this is what she's teaching them. And, and he, you know what? She taught him that, and now as a grown man, the words of King Lemuel... He remembered that. It stuck with him. The things that you teach your children will stick with them. I was going to get there later, but I'm going to turn there right now. 
Proverbs 22, verse 6, and this sums up everything. This sums up the importance of, of, a, of, a, of a mother's job. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That exemplifies how important a mother's job is. If you train, training requires work. Okay, training isn't just go out and play, go out and play, go out and play, go out and play. I'm going to go watch soap operas and eat bonbons on the couch. That's not training. If anything, that's training your child to be lazy and not to do anything. <laughs> training requires work. It requires effort. It requires you spending time with them. It requires teaching. It requires all, you know, all of this stuff. You know, showing them God's word, teaching them how to read, teaching all these different attributes and aspects that they need to know. You train up a child in the way he should go. When he's older, he should not depart from it. That's what, that's what God's word says. That's what the Bible says. That is the importance, and that's why mothers have one of the most important jobs in the world. Because you are literally impacting the future. Future generations with your own children. Do you think about this? Think about the amount of lives that will be touched by one individual. I mean, think about your own life. How many people have you come into contact with? How many lives have you touched? How many people have you had influence on in your own personal life? Now think about your children. And if you have more than one, you have one, two, three, however many you have, that's that many more people that your teaching and training will impact from the time they're real young when they grow up and become adults and they go out into this world and all the impact and influence that they have on other people starts with the teaching and the training that you give them as young children. That's where it starts. And it's so exciting when we see little children growing up in church and learning God's word and learning the truth because they have such a greater advantage now to go out and do great things for God and, and, and can start off early on just having a great impact on other people's lives and being a blessing to other people. <clears throat> I'm going to skip that part for now. You've heard that phrase, the Bible, or not the Bible, the, the phrase in the world that just says, you know, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. That's true. There's truth to that. Because, because of the importance and, and because of the impact you have on your children's lives. I mean, your children look to you and, and, and they believe you and they listen to you. When, when they're young, you know, whatever you teach them, whatever it is that you teach them is going to have an impact on them. Now, hopefully you're teaching them the truth. Hopefully, you know, they're not going to grow up and be like, oh man, that stuff that I was learning, that's not true at all. But if you're teaching them the truth, they'll, they'll realize that and they'll see that as you're up and everything that you've said to them will just be confirmed, hopefully. The things that you teach them should be confirmed as they grow up and say, yes, this is true. Yes, this is true. And then all of those things that you've, that you've taught them will stay with them even more and even longer and, the, and they'll give a lot more regard to the, to the law. You know, the Bible says in, um, in Proverbs 1.8, it says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Don't forsake the law of your mother. Mother should have laws, rules for the children. Follow these because you don't want them to do that which is wrong. You want them to grow up right. You have these rules. You've got to follow these rules. This is the law of thy mother. Listen to it. And he says, you know, hear the instruction of thy father. Forsake not the law of thy mother. <clears throat> Raising children directly impacts the future. Mothers end up, their, their job is to mold and to shape and to teach and to strengthen and prepare these children to be successful, to be wise, to be godly as they become adults. This is an important job. There's a, I mean, the, there's a lot of bad influences out there. I mean, the world is full of them. The devil is out trying to deceive. The devil wants to get you away from God. You know, the, the world in general, the entertainment industry, the music industry, they're all pointed at children and, and teenagers and young people, and it's all pointed in giving them and introducing bad, bad uh, morals, you know, this promiscuity and sleeping around and all this other stuff, doing the drugs, drinking alcohol, glorifying all that. Satan's really good at making sin look great and appealing and sucking people in and drawing them away from God. That's why it's so important to strengthen children when they're young before the world has that much of an impact on them. Shelter them from them at first and, and get them strengthened and built up in God's word. Teach them, train them, spend time with them. So that when these, when these attacks come, 
when they when they see the deceitful billboards, when they see the deceitful you know um, promotions of, of wickedness, they can see through that and say, "No, I'm not. You're not going to trick me. I'm not going to go down that road. I'm going to listen to the teaching that my mother taught me. That's not for kings to go off and go do that stuff." I'm going to do something with my life. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to do that which is right. I'm going to have integrity. And they're going to get that teaching and training from their mothers at home. The time and the work and the love that you invest in your children will have an influence on so many more people than you probably even realize. All the, the numbers of people that we come into contact with. I mean, think about this. If you raise your children to love God and to know the Bible, to be soul winners and to be able to, to, be able to, to, to approach someone and just give them the gospel of Jesus Christ from a young age, just to be able to show them how to be saved. I mean, people's souls, people's eternal judgment, their fate, where they end up, heaven and hell, is dependent on us, on, on, on Christians going out and preaching the gospel to every creature. God has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people unto God by explaining how Jesus Christ died and shed his blood for their sins. That is our job. And if you train your child to do that from a young age, think of how many people they can reach and how many lives they can impact. How many souls can be saved from going to hell through the work that you've done with your children? It's an incredible, it's an incredible amount of work. And see, women... A lot of women, they, they focus on the wrong things. They'll say, like, you know, the Bible says that, that it's not permitted for women to speak in the church. And they'll look at that and be like, oh, man, I can't believe that. I can't, you know, like, like that's not fair. That's sexist. You know, we ought to have a woman pastor, all this other stuff. But look, God knows the roles that he's given for us. Just because it's not ordained for a woman to stand behind the pulpit and preach in the church does not mean that the woman is any less important or that she can't have an even bigger role in, in the lives of other people and in changing other people's lives. This isn't the job for that, but what about the job of being a mother? Like I said, I mean, you could impact so many more people than even I can behind this pulpit by raising your children right. Maybe you can raise a godly man of God or a godly woman of God that can go out and, 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 and do tremendous amounts of work. And the more children you have, that's that many more that you can multiply that by. It's, it's a great responsibility. It's a great task. And it's a task specifically given to, to, to mothers. Now look, the fathers, again, the fathers have a role in training the children as well. Okay? But I don't really want to spend much time in that because it's really important to focus on how important the mothers should be spending the most time with children by far. God has designed for, I mean, that's why mothers nurse their children, not fathers. It's, fathers can't do that. The mothers are around them and take care of them and nurture them for, for way more time. And the father, the father needs to be out working and, and, and providing for the family. And because of that job, that takes him away from his children. That takes him away from his family. By, it's just the way it is. It's the way God has made it. But the mother is there spending the time and doing the majority of the teaching and the training. Now, a biblical example of, of what I was just mentioning about, about the impact that you can have on people's lives is in, uh, in Timothy. And there's no doubt that Timothy was a great man of God. He was a preacher. He was a pastor. He had great influence on the lives of many people. But in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 5, the Bible says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, excuse me, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, Eunice or Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So Paul's saying, I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith. It's, he's got this great faith that's in him. It's unfeigned. He's not faking it. He's, he's got this, this real, true faith in God. He said, it, it dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois. Paul knows his family. He said, look, I know your grandma. Your grandma's got a great unfeigned faith in God. It started with her. And then that transferred down to her daughter, his mother Eunice. His mother then had also the great unfeigned faith. The grandmother passed it down to the mother, the mother passed it down to the son. And now you see Timothy here, a third generation Christian, a third generation believer that has been taught well by his grandmother, by his mother, going down to him to now where he's a great man of God doing all kinds of great works for God. But what if his grandmother Lois didn't spend the time and didn't, didn't raise up her, her daughter Eunice right? 
Where would Timothy be? We don't know. Who knows? Who knows what would have happened in that situation? But thank God that, that Lois decided to have a, a great unfeigned faith in God and to do that which is right because apparently she, what she had done had to be right for, for Timothy to, to turn out the way he has and for this mention of Lois and Eunice in here. Being a mother is an extremely demanding job. And um, it definitely requires a lot of hard work. But as Christians, we, we, we really ought to get back to a proper biblical view of what, of what the mother's role is and, and how important it is and how much time they ought to be spending with their children. Now, I'm going to be wrapping things up here, just in closing. Different things that take away from the sermon this morning. First of all, of course, children are a blessing. And the Bible's clear about that. If you're married... You know, obviously that is when you ought to have children, not outside of marriage, but if you're married, you, should have, you know, don't, don't be messing around with, with God's plan. Let him decide when he's going to open the womb, if he's going to close the womb. You know, just have faith in God. You know, if you want, if you want children, pray for God to have them, but, but um, you know, I wouldn't recommend going into the ways of the world and getting involved in, in all these different forms of birth control and, and, and IVF and all these other different things, kind of tampering around with God's design in the, way, in the way that He's made you. Let Him determine when is the right time for you to have children. Let Him determine how many children you ought to have. Point number two, for moms that are still raising children and, and women that want to be moms, take your job seriously. You know, your job is so important. You need to... Don't think of your children as just a burden. They're not... I mean, yes, they're a lot of work. But that's not all they are. That, your children should not just be work for you. You shouldn't just look at them and be like, oh man, that's just work. That's just a lot of work for me. Look at that little girl back there. That's just so much work. <laughs> How can you even say that? Look at that smile. But don't view your children that way. It's, 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 there's so much more than that. It, you know, yes, it's a lot of work. But you do it out of love. I mean, the, the amount of work that I do at my job, it's not necessarily just because I love doing that work so much. It's because I love my family so much and I want to provide for them. And whatever I can do to, to, to give them the, the, the most that I can, that is where my heart really is, is, is for doing that to serve them. The same way it should be with your children, mothers. You should look at them and say, hey, they mean a lot to me. I have a great vision for their life. I want them to grow up right. I want them to do that which is right. And I'm, I know it's a lot of work, but I'm going to invest whatever time is needed. I'm going to spend the time with them. I'm going to forsake other things maybe that I care about. Maybe some of the hobbies or the, or the other things that, that get my interest or some of the entertainment that I, that I can be doing. And, and, and if that's what it takes, then I'm going to spend the time on the children to make sure that they're growing up right. And um, you know, understand that God has equipped you to be a great mother. God has. God has given you what you need to be a great mother. If God's given you children, he is, I, I'm sure he has comments that you can be a great mother, but it's choice is yours if you're going to be or not. Decide to do the things and decide to be a mother the way that the Bible is laid out. Study God's word. Study these different chapters. Study these different verses that talk about you know, your role as a mother and, and how you ought to raise your children. Especially in the book of Proverbs, there's so much wisdom. You could read the rest of Proverbs 31. I didn't really want to get into it today. But it talks about this virtuous woman and how hardworking she is, how she goes out and gets gets her you know her clothing and the, and the the food from afar. She makes clothing for her own household and she prepares the food. She gets up early. She stays up late. She does all this hard work for her family, and she's being praised as a virtuous woman, as a good woman, as a godly woman. It's a great chapter to look at women to to um, for for guidance and how you ought to live and what you ought to strive for. I'm still here in Proverbs 31, verse 28 says, Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. So this is, this is, these are all the attributes he's given. He's saying, look, if you're doing your job right, if you're doing all these things, if you're working real hard, your children, they're going to grow up, they're going to call you blessed. Your husband, he's going to praise you for doing such a great job. And, and, that's, and that's a great thing to have. It's a great blessing to have. Third, moms with, with grown children, all right? Maybe your children are already out of the house. Teach the younger mom all these truths. To teach, you know, you should, your job then is also to be, to be helping the younger women. And that's what it says in Titus chapter 2. If you want to turn, there's a last place we'll turn. Titus chapter 2. 
I mean, obviously, once your children are up and grown, you've already done the teaching and the training and that, and that, that, that real hard work of, of, of um, getting them fed and making sure they're taken care of and making sure they don't kill themselves and, you know, just watching over them and protecting them. You've done that hard work, but now, you know, as a, as a mother that's, that's already grown, you've gained a lot of wisdom over the years. You've, you've learned a lot of things in, in, in all of your experiences that you can pass on to others. In Titus chapter number 2, Verse number three, the Bible says, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. These are all the different things that he's saying the aged women ought to be teaching the younger women. You've been there. Look, he's saying, be sober, be serious, take your job seriously, love your husbands, love your children. You know, don't, don't get bitter against either of them. Don't look at them as just a burden. Love your husbands. Love your children. Be discreet. Be chaste. Be pure. Keep yourself right with God. Keepers at home. Don't be wandering off from house to house and getting being busy bodies and tattlers and getting involved in everyone else's business. Be a keeper at home. Be good. Be obedient to your own husband that the word of God be not blasphemed. That's what the Bible says. This is, this is a job that older moms, moms that, have, that have had children already on out, that the elder women, or the, that's not the elder, the aged women can, can do. And that is an important job for them as well. And then fourth, for everybody to take away from the sermon, give thanks and appreciation for the mom that you've had, or the, you know, the mom that you have right now, if you've had a mom in the past. You ought to appreciate that. You know, not everyone has a great upbringing. I get that. There are many moms out there that haven't done a very good job as a mother. But whatever, whatever the situation is, you still ought to be thankful. I mean, if you're here today, you're, you're in church, you're doing that which is right, you know, give thanks, give appreciation for your mother. You know, you don't know whatever she had to go through and, and everything else. It's, uh, it's a lot of work. And... Um, <clears throat> Even just looking out for your safety and keeping you alive through the years is a lot of work. Keeping you fed, getting food on the plate. So be thankful for the mothers. And um, as, as, we, as we're about to leave here, the, the last verse I'm going to quote, because this just seems to be the, the way we're headed. Proverbs 30, verse 11 says, There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. And this seems to be the way that, that things are going in today's day and age. Where, where children are becoming much more rebellious and they don't seem to care what their parents are teaching and what they're saying unto them because society in general is just getting more and more wicked and they're getting deceived and brought into the world and the world's philosophies and the world's garbage. And we ought to bless our mothers. Let's not become this generation of, of you know, people that, that curse their father, do not bless their mother. Let's take today and let's bless our mothers. Let's have respect for all the hard work that they do and embrace the role that God has given to women and the mothers and exalt that. It's, it's, it's a very honor-worthy job that mothers have. It's not something to be, to be looked down upon or denigrated. You know, it's a wicked society that puts down the role of a mother or, or a woman. It is. It's wicked. Now, again, I mean, there's different jobs that they perform, but the job that they perform, look, men can't perform that job the same way that women can. The raising of the children, the rearing of the children is something that God has designed women to do so much better than men. Now there is, a, obviously again, a man's job, he has his specific role in the family. Lord, I'm not going to get into that. I've already ta taught on the, the husband's job in the family. But um, let's honor that job and give respect unto it and appreciate the fact that, that moms do so much hard work. Let's bow right for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for a mother's your God. I thank you for my mother. I uh, thank you for the for the hard work that she has done for me, dear God, but for all the mothers in this world, dear God, that, that, have, that have done good and, and have raised their children right, dear Lord, we thank you so much for that. We thank you for the clear teaching and instruction that you've given us in the Bible.
Lord, help us, help the mothers especially, but, but us in general, never to look at children as a burden, but, but look at them as uh, really important people that are going to grow up one day and hopefully serve you. Help us to teach them and train them properly. Lord, help us to, um, to just get into your word and study it and meditate on it, dear Lord, and live by it to the best of our ability. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.